Somebody uh, recently, yesterday, sort of figured out what I mean when I keep saying the music is a clue, but not really. The music is a clue. That's all. I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, all right. So never mind about that. Today is a very special day in a lot of different ways, including the fact we have a great nose panel. I mean, we pretty much usually have a great nose panel, but Sam Hatch uh, co-hosts the Culture Dogs on uh, Sunday nights on WWUH at 8 p.m. It is really one of the very few times during the week that we allow you to turn your dial or whatever it is you used away from WNPR and you can listen to WWH without guilt because the culture dogs are that good. Uh, Rich Holland is a principal uh, and design director at CoLab and a commissioner on cultural affairs for the city of Hartford. Carolyn Payne almost needs no introduction to the news anymore, but she's an actress, comedian, <laughs> dancer, founder, director, and choreographer of Kinetic Dance, and that's just scratching the surface. So uh, a little bit later in the show, uh, we have been watching uh, Cobra Kai, which is YouTube Red. Uh, YouTube Red is sort of a new... Uh, concept within the YouTube universe, uh, but it's a, an original series which extends the story of the original Karate Kid movies. Uh, it's not a reboot. I think it's an extension. Uh, and we'll also be talking about uh, a topic that none of the panelists wants to discuss. We should almost have that every week built in as a feature, <laughs> you know, that one of the topics would be a topic that none of the panelists want to discuss. I thought it was. I thought. <laughs> well, no. Everything on the show is that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> but there often are – well, anyway, the royal wedding, which none of the panels want to discuss. But that's too bad. Um, and But we're going to begin with the other thing, the other couple. I mean, you know, Harry and Meghan uh, may be the big couple of the week. But you could argue – that the other big couple was Yanni and Laurel, although or Yanni, Yanni. I mean, you see Yanni, Yanni, Yanni. And Laurel, yeah. Um, so you probably know about this by now. Uh, <laughs> on the off chance that you don't have internet or something, um, you only listen to the radio. There probably are people like that. So even so, I mean, it's been covered by the New York Times and All Things Considered and everything. It's one of those things that gets circulated around on the internet where people have two absolutely unchangeable but completely contradictory uh, reactions to. And it's a sound file and, and the person is saying a two-syllable word. And at that point, there's sort of a fork in the road beyond it's a two-syllable word. And some people hear one thing and some people hear another thing. What we're going to do for you right now, and we're just going to kind of talk over it a little bit, uh, the New York Times has now done this thing where they, they've got a little uh, file with a slider on it where uh, they can adjust the frequency so that you're at the lower frequency, you're more likely to hear Laurel. At the higher frequency, you're more likely to hear Yanni. But, uh, well, so why don't we just play that? And meanwhile, I will poll the, um, the panel here on what they heard in the first place. You know, you're either a Laurel or you're a, a Yanni, just the same way you were either gold and white or blue and black. So um, here we go. Start playing it. Yeah. Okay, so what are you yeah. here? What are you, Rich? I am yeah. straight up Team Laurel. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and Sam Hatch. I am. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I can yeah. go both ways. I began yeah. as a Yanniite, uh, yeah. but now that I know yeah. how Laurel sounds because of that sliding yeah. scale, yeah. I can. Yeah. Hear. You can hear the Laurel, but you yeah. were Yanni. Your initial. I started you went, as a Yanni. You went yeah. Yanni. All yeah. right. Yeah. So tiebreaker over. Laurel. Yanni. Yanni. Laurel. Really? Yeah. Okay. Laurel. So well, actually. Laurel. I was a lawyer, Laurel. so I guess we're sort of Laurel. deadlocked here about yeah. this. Yeah. So <laughs> it doesn't matter for me where on that frequency you are. It's yeah, always it's, Laurel. it's always Laurel. That's how I'm See, I only can hear Laurel at a certain frequency. Yeah, yeah when he goes can you hear low, it turns Laurel. Yeah. People are really turning off their radios at this point. <laughs> um, Actually, that sounded a little like they were saying yelly. <laughs> <laughs> or uncanny or something like that. All right, so... Um, I guess the question isn't that. It's it's sort of why do we like these things so much? I mean, uh, maybe you even could sort of let me start over on this side this time with, with Carolyn. Like, did you wind up in arguments and conversations and things like that with people? Yeah, uh, Alex, my roommate, and I definitely had a probably good thirty minute discussion over this. He <laughs> adamantly heard Laurel and was like, "What is wrong with your ears?" So like, what are you, we? You know, we went back and forth, and then it, we took to Twitter t and Facebook to see what other people were saying. And 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 so I think people like this because it gives you something to talk about other than like your own life or problems or <laughs> discussing who's going to scoop cat litter. Like at least you can have an argument about something a little bit, <laughs> a little bit different. Well. Although, I mean, it, that could just get be folded and everything else. Because if you won't <laughs> scoop the cat litter, you know, Alex is going to say, well, that, that's so Yanny. That's like, 
<laughs> just like a Yanny. Figures. Just like a Yanny. That's, maybe just that's the way you are. It's a type A, type B personality. Yeah. Thing. yeah. Sam, how did this work for you on social media or anywhere else? I, or IRL, as they say. Unfortunately, it didn't really work out into any major arguments. Uh, I had d- determined that it was a frequency issue pretty early on. And I realized that uh, since I have, despite being in a band and Attending many concerts, I've retained a lot of my my higher hearing, <laughs> and I can hear those annoying ringtones that the kids would use sometimes uh, on their phones that were supposedly adults can't hear. Yeah, over a certain frequency. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I realize that if you can hear well, or you're listening to on something on headphones that have a good you know high frequency response, then you're gonna hear Yanny possibly. Um, so yeah, I, I understood the science behind it too quickly. All so right. no arguments. Yeah, so you you weren't well poised to have irrational conversations. About it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the entire point of this. I was phenomenon. frustrated to find out that I was the one who was in the wrong, and it was Laurel. Yeah, it is right. Laurel. Though. Yeah. yeah. So, All right. How about how about you? Rich? Did you, did you find yourself know. at work? Uh, no, and uh, I argue with people about things like this all the time, and <laughs> <laughs> insisting that I'm right. It kind of goes along with the Oxford comma. I love and the Oxford comma. Thank you. Right. Yeah, that's, right. that's a poll I'm right team there. Oxford comma. You're team Oxford. Yeah. How about awesome. one space or two after oh, periods? One space, and I don't care what the research is saying. One space. One space. <laughs> one yeah. space yeah. Two space was just like trying to add in extra space to like yeah. flesh out no, your paper. No, come it's, on. it's grow one. up. One space. But, one space. But um, jo- this Jonathan, is the best hold panel on. ever. Jonathan, am I two spaces? Because uh, I, I, know, I know that we have, uh, yes, I am two spaces. That's right. And and Jonathan has written in capital letters, one bleeping, bleeping yeah. space. <laughs> you you uh, can hear my entire office swearing as they have to run searches to remove two spaces. Yes. Um, so um, my general take on that, <laughs> to try and stay on topic. What is your general? Bit. Yeah, what is your general? Take? My, so I didn't actually have any discussions about um, whether it's Laurel or Yanni. Mm-hmm. I had more discussions of, why are we doing this still? Mm-hmm. Uh, which are kind of interesting. In um, in a lot of the the arguments thus far have been because we've got nothing better to do. This is what I'm and, saying. Uh, like, you know, we and need gonna, something. Yeah, so there's that. But I think that for me, the prevailing argument for me was that um, that the internet has come alive and it's become a thing. It's become a human being uh, that is constantly and desperately looking for its 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. uh, and that that 15 minutes has been condensed to, like, 15 seconds so we could get a whole lot more of them in time. So, like, the Internet wants – it's the Internet is sort of like Donald Trump in the sense that Mm -hmm. he doesn't like for a day to go by that we don't pay attention to him in some very visceral way. You're saying that the Internet itself in a very HAL 2000-like way – Exactly. You know, wants us to – I love that theory. I love it a lot. I, I'll tell you my theory, which is I think that we like these things. It's it's a subset of some of the stuff that's been said here, but I, I think it's for me a more acute thing. There, there are increasingly things that we can't talk about. Like you just can't talk about these things. Um, I mean, you you don't want to get into it. For example, I have the people who live across the street who I'm very fond of. I like them a lot as neighbors. And our dogs like each other and everything. They happen to be very involved with APAC. So the day they told me that, I thought, well, I have to make sure the Middle East never comes up. We, could just, we will just never talk about that. You know? And so we have things like that, conversations we don't want to get into. <laughs> so yeah. these, these conversations, they're like parking spaces, right? You could even have a pretty strong argument. Like you and Alex could really go at it about the whole question about whether it's Yanni or Laurel, which is not the same as like Hillary Clinton versus Barack Obama or something like that, right? There's, it's, no, it's a no-stakes argument. I think we like those things. Yeah, you won't walk yeah. away completely ter- you know, Yeah, it's not going to like yeah. fill you with rage with yeah. that person, hopefully. <laughs> And it, but it gives you something that you can debate and then move yeah. on from. Yeah. You're not, it's not going to change your view of that person. I mean, hopefully. I think it's subtle advertising for, a- for Yanni, the, the new age musician, because he's coming on tour. Yeah, that's right. He's so launching something. I think, something. Oh. I think yeah. he's behind it. Right. There's Is a name you haven't heard in a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That if you screw up the frequency well enough, you end up with Yanni. You might actually hear one of his <laughs> yeah, famous <laughs> tunes. As heard yeah, on the Acropolis. All, all yeah. the, the sound of this was about as annoying as a Yanni song. Right. So. <laughs> this is so all I can't hate the Yanni. One big plot uh, right. to in, in keep, facilitate the Yanni comeback. It, exactly. In keeping with your thought, Colin, my yeah. dad had this concept, right, that there are two things that you never, ever, ever debate or get into conversations about. It was politics and paint colors. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he proceeded to get into like heated conversations about both topics. <laughs> Why? I I feel like paint colors might even be spill over onto those dresses, almost literally. The you know, <laughs> true, yeah, gold and white. Really, yeah. I mean, like you can get into a heated conversation. Oh my goodness! In my house, yeah, man, yeah. that was intense. 
Well, I suppose if it's a room you're going to live in, yeah. you're arguing about how what color you're going to paint it. I get to see there's big stakes here. By the way, Yanni did a tweet that he only hears Yanni. Ha ha ha. Because <laughs> that's really funny. Uh, you could do better than that. You could you know, come up with a little. Uh, all right. So, yeah. I, I, but I love Rich's theory, too, which is that the Internet kind of wants us. To, to notice it. The, un- the internet is like an unfulfilled musical theater student. Like- <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, yes. Right. Got it. Wow, that sounds deeply like personal. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't hold a musical theater degree. Mine's in theater. Okay. The, the other <laughs> good tweet, and I did see this one earlier, is Marley Matlin who uh, tweeted, Yanni or Laurel, don't ask me. I can't hear bleep. Um, <laughs> so... Um, so I don't know. Is there anything left to say about uh, – before we move on to the topic you don't want to talk about, is there anything else that you need to get off your chest about this particular topic? No, I just wish – now that I wish – now that you read the, the uh, Mary Martlin thing, yeah. I wish that she had picked one. Right. So let me ask you a question because the answer – my answer to this question is no. <laughs> Do you remember which color dress you saw back in the – when we were completely divided as a nation? Uh, and as an internet universe, over which dra- color dress we saw. Do you remember which one you were? I think were? I saw the white and gold, white and gold. Yeah. yeah. Do you, I think do you I saw the bluish one. Yeah. I saw the white one. You definitely, you, you definitely know, but you're sort of a design color. Mm-hmm. You're going to remember something yeah. like that. It was yeah. a bad photograph, though. And, and can was, I tell you? That's what I took away so from it. So the first thing that I did, yeah. um, after I made a decision on what it was, yes. I verified. Yeah. I pulled it down, brought it into software, color corrected <laughs> it. <laughs> That's like yeah. It's, it was just a, a rough photograph. It but, needed adjustments. But see, that's the problem. Like you even noted, I think, Rich, that this week, you know, the New York Times and NPR. I mean, they got involved. First of all, they traced it back to its source. Mm-hmm. You know, it's from a dictionary dot com thing or something. Uh, and but we don't want to know that, do we? No. I mean, like we don't want to know stuff like that. The whole, the whole point is ambiguity, right? So we can have something to. Something to argue Something about. Something to argue yeah. about. All right. So we're going to move move along here. Even even if all I can ever get out of you is I don't want to talk about this. But I bet you I can get more out of you. So we're <laughs> heading into the weekend. <laughs> so wait, we have the option of just stonewalling. So <laughs> this could be the I best have No comment. It yeah. wouldn't be the first time. Um, well, no, I actually sort of think, well, okay. There's a lot to talk about here. The, so oh, we have a term on the nose. We have, a, we have a term on the nose called the Papulian through line. And that is named after Irene Papoulos. And the idea is you look for something that that, that is – connect some of the topics because um, she can always find a way to do this. And Rich is going to have one in the second segment that will connect all three topics. But the one that I think for people in England, the royals are kind of Yanni and Laurel. I mean, they're something that you could talk about all the time, but they don't really matter. <laughs> Um, and so they really like I, I listen to this podcast every week that's hosted by a very funny British comedian named Frank Skinner and he has two of his confederates there and they, they talk all the time about this stuff they, I mean they talk for like 40 minutes about the letter that Meghan Markle's brother wrote basically saying don't do this man <laughs> don't do it <laughs> no. and they were just having the best time ever and they don't really care it doesn't really matter anyway so so you say you have lots to talk about Rich so you get us started well so it- not to surprise anybody here, but I could not care less about the royals, right? Yeah. Um, they're the they're the least fascinating thing to me, um, <laughs> and uh, because you know they're just they're going to walk through their paces. Were you, know, were you on when we did the crown? I feel like you, yes, we, I yes, was absolutely or, on oh, when yeah. we did the crown, <laughs> okay. and yeah. you know, and, and I felt like Carolyn then yeah. I was whacking my head on the table. It's like, do I really have to watch this thing about <laughs> <laughs> about rich white people? And um, so, uh, and I, I assume you don't think they solved that problem by getting. Meghan Markle. No, I think they did amazingly well. Yeah. You know, because now I think we've got like the Clampets meet the meet the Crown is what we've got <laughs> going on. Um, my my favorite part is of this whole arc and the part that keeps me interested is not at all the royal wedding and, you know, and the predictability of what all that's going to be and, mm-hmm. you know, and how mannered and manicured that's going to be. Mm-hmm. It's what's happening with that wacky Markle family. Right. The Markles. You know, it's their, <laughs> right. for me, and that's my through line, it's their 15 minutes that I'm interested in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when I take a look at um, at at this oaf of of uh, Thomas Markle, uh, 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 Megan's Se- senior Ma- or junior, uh, senior. Okay, uh, the dad who like staged this photo shoot, and you know that's turning into this huge embarrassing controversy. And it's conveniently um, having heart surgery during <laughs> the wedding. <laughs> exactly, it's fabulous. But he staged this. It's fascinating that this guy staged this photo shoot. Um, 
and uh, and nobody's happy with him about this, you know. And he staged it with these paparazzi that took images of him in this internet cafe that mm-hmm. just looks absolutely awful. Um, and uh, and somehow the system that wants uh, that wants this kind of like glossy egg perfection of what this movie of what this marriage is going to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, is taking a look at this bumble that this guy's making with the paparazzi, you know, and uh, and making him the the sort of uh, the demon of this story. Well, I mean, in a way, this is the universe taking its ultimate revenge because nobody is ever really good enough. If we think back to mm-hmm. Princess Diana, Princess Diana, in certain ways, was not satisfying to them. Exactly. Was not what they'd hoped for, not what they wanted. Was constantly being made to feel as though she were some kind. But of But Harry, outlier. who yeah. Harry marries, and yeah. and. Harry doesn't matter anymore as far as a royal really, right? He's as, sixth in line. Right. <laughs> so that's that's kind of low shot, that's kind of right? low down. I mean <laughs> He's like designated survivor. <laughs> right. So like I mean at this point, He's like <laughs> you know, he could be marrying a blow up doll and it just like wouldn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> like he's not. He would get a real, real doll, not just a regular blow-up doll. I mean, you still get yeah. to be a princess, so yeah. right, sure. So, so th- that's your feeling. Is this is incredibly low stakes, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think that this is th- that important. Any, I, I, I could care less. I didn't even realize it was this weekend. No, I didn't either. Yeah. I had no. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> it was not on my social calendar, unfortunately, no or idea. my interest radar. I, yeah. I get the feeling the culture dogs are not covering this either. I had my wife give. I was doing laundry last night. And I'm like, quick, give me just like the, <laughs> the, the, the rudimentary give me, basics give me your on elevator this. pitch. And then in the middle of the night, I woke up and rolled over at one point. And she's like, "All right, who's getting married? And then who's who's the who's the groom? And uh, why why is it a controversy? And I'm, I'm trying yeah. to like remember all these little details." And, uh, yeah, I still don't. I, I haven't retained much of it. Yeah. Well, the New York Times today has a piece, uh, uh, the most tawdry portion of which I, uh, I sort of broke off and, and sent to you as a, a link from The Sun. Uh, about, and, but the New York Times has a piece about how this is being merchandised every which way, which is the funny thing. The yes. other thing about the, the royals, which is that they're, they're, you know, on the one hand, have this kind of quasi-sacrosanct air to them that they are – you know, leaders of the state and leaders of the church, although they are leaders of neither, you know, that they are somehow or other this shining example uh, to the world and, and un, uh, untainted by commerce, except that you know, every time that one of these things happens, it's merchandised to death. Oh, the commemorative plates yeah. and, yeah. and, and tea the, towels. And, and, the, and, the, and the sex toys. Yeah. Oh, yep. um, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are Harry and Meghan sex toys. They didn't look very good, though. No. No, I was... As sex toys go, you mean like what is the market compared to what? I guess yeah. I'm a designer. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you these. Okay, things. but like, what is the market on that? Like, <laughs> oh, I don't think me? we want to go there. <laughs> um, Hopefully, it stays in its package. Right. That's the market. So let me ask this: Is it interesting that this? She's well. Let's start. She's an American. Mm-hmm. Does it? Does I mean even back to your point? Okay, they're rich white people. Well, she's an American. She's a divorcee, and she's a mixed race person. So like, to me, this is like you know. That's that's the only thing that I find interesting about this, but not interesting enough to care. <laughs> <laughs> what more would she have to be? <laughs> Huh? What more would she have to be like in this Sydney's Liberation Army or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I just don't care about weddings. Yeah, you know. Agreed. Yeah, well, it's just like it's a thing. Though, can I tell you? This morning, I saw this beautiful image um, of her in a white blouse, surrounded with this gorgeous smile, surrounded mm-hmm. by these um, these Rwandan children, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh wow, that's like so very Princess Di. Right. Um, yeah, it is Princess Di. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll say this. This is my Papulian through line that connects us to the next segment, which is I do think that there's something mildly, seriously significant about this. I'll take the risk of, of averring that. And that is that, you know, I've been thinking this a lot about this a lot also in connection with politics. Like here in Connecticut, we're having kind of a protracted conversation about politics and race mm-hmm. and about representation and diversity on tickets and stuff like that. And I keep saying, you know, to millennials – this is a weird conversation because they're kind yeah. of over it, you know? And, and it's not a question of is there going to be a black person? Are you going to go to one of the cities and find a black person to be on your political ticket? That's, you know, to millennials, black people aren't people who live over there in the city. Mm-hmm. Black people are your college roommate and they're people you marry. <laughs> they're people yeah. that you marry. <laughs> and, and I do feel as though, you know, this, this is 
millennialism. This is the no, not millennialism as a religion, but these are this is the millennial moment for the royal family. They've got a millennial yeah. prince, and this is what he does because that's what millennials do. They they don't think in the categories that we did. There's a Browning of America, and now there's a Browning of the royal family. And I say good. I say good. That's my serious point. Yeah. There, right. There's another article worth reading, uh, along with you know the one on sex toys from from New York Times. And you it's, can just take our word for that one. Yeah, yeah exactly. You don't need to actually read it. There wasn't much article there. Um, <laughs> there was just mostly pictures. Um, there's an article in the New Yorker uh, that's entitled. Uh, I just noticed in my notes, uh, "We are all Thomas Merkel." Mm-hmm. And and I think that that to me is the underlying truth of what's going on here. You well, know, the, yeah, to see more about that. Well, it's it's that um, he's entering. We're we're not the the people who are getting married in in uh, in carriages and with trains that you know require fifty people to to track them. Yeah. So many folks are you know want to align with this fantasy, mm-hmm. but really at the end of of the day, we're this schmuck trying to figure out what our fifteen minutes will amount to mm-hmm. and doing the best with it and. Fumbling the ball every way. <laughs> All right. Well, um, w- it, the news has broken by the way that Prince Charles will be walking Meghan down the aisle. And since Thomas is not uh, available to do so, I would say that she, he is walking Meghan down the aisle and kind of handing the world over to her and her over to the world all in one thing. And I think it's sort of maybe the end of his generation's significance. All right. So we have something much more important to talk about, and that <coughs> is Cobra Kai. Uh, and I have a lot to say about Cobra Kai. So we're going to take a break now. I bet you the whole panel does too, at least compared to what they had to say about the Markles, as Carolyn now calls the royal family. They're not the Windsors anymore. <laughs> Forget about the Windsors. Almost every night. Well, she's no lady, she's my wife. The preacher asked her, and she said, I do. The preacher asked me, and she said, yes. The preacher said, I pronounce you 99 to life. Son, she's no lady, she's your wife. And I can't remember. Melt like candle, wax it on and I wax it off. On your body, call me Mr. Miyagi. Sex karate, wax it on and I wax it off. And the way she was my girl, she be in the spot alone. That's actually a song recently recorded by uh, Austin Marigold, who I happen to be very into these days, um, in a way that, well, never mind, um, in an old guy, dad dancing kind of way. Um, so anyway, uh, and the point is that the, here's a young guy, young British um, pop singer who's using Karate Kid idioms in his music because the Karate Kid is just with us forever. It is embedded in us forever. And now we have a way to go on living with the Karate Kid. It's called Cobra Kai. Uh, It's uh, airing right now on something called YouTube Red, although Jonathan is informing me that it's about to change its name to YouTube Premium in the coming weeks. As he says, now that there's a reason in the world for anyone to have ever heard (laughs) of YouTube Red, they are changing the name of it. But anyway... It is an extension uh, of the story uh, of uh, Karate Kid. Both of the protagonists have grown up. Uh, they, uh, protagonist being uh, the Ralph Macchio character, uh, Daniel LaRusso, uh, and then Johnny Lawrence, his opponent, uh, which, and, and who was played by William Rapka. Is that his name? Billy Lisa? Zabka. What's it? William Zabka. Zabka, William yeah. Zabka, yeah. He's, by the way, just so terrific in this. Anyway, uh, they've grown up now. Uh, Daniel is a uh, car dealership magnate. Johnny is a left-behind loser. Uh, They run into one another at the car dealership. uh, And uh, because Johnny's car has been run into, uh, and uh, so Daniel uh, wants to uh, introduce his former karate opponent around to the staff. Here's a little bit from the series. Hey, hey, Anoush, come here. Louie, get over here. I want you to meet somebody. No, 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 no. This is Johnny Lawrence. He and I go way back, right, buddy? This guy was the toughest dude in my high school. When I first moved here from Jersey, he and I, we got into it a little bit. This guy really had it in for me. Yeah, well, you did move in on my girl. Well, she actually wasn't really your girl anymore, was she? I mean, ah, all right, that's all water under the bridge. Wait, is this the karate guy? The guy from the tournament? Oh, this is the guy whose ass she kicked. Uh, listen, it was a really close match, but if you want to get technical, 
I kicked his face. <laughs> I'm just busting your chops. It was an illegal kick. Oh, illegal? Really? Come on, what about that elbow to my knee? Yeah, I got a warning. You got the wind. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No fighting in the showroom, guys. <laughs> yeah, come on. All right, back to work. All right, nice meeting you. Let's go. Get back to work. Enough reminiscing, right? Yeah, enough reminiscing, but there's never enough reminiscing, Sam, and we're in a period right now where generally kind of 80s uh, pop culture is being repurposed uh, every which way, uh, whether it's Fuller House or Twin Peaks or Roseanne Barr. Or, I mean, I, we could just go on and on and on here. So how, how does this one do? I actually, one of the things I, I liked about it the most is that it's very much in the now. Uh, William Zabka's character is this man who's trapped in the 80s, and that's looked at as something to be pitied and laughed at. Uh, but meanwhile, it's loaded with Game of Thrones references, and as much as it references the Karate Kid, it's also referencing what's going on around us now, and it's very much about the kids of these characters and what they're doing. So I appreciated that, and it's awesome seeing William Zabka doing something of this size. I was a fan of his character himself on How I Met Your Mother. Mm -hmm. He was on the entire last season because there was a, a joke about Neil Patrick Harris's character misconstruing the Karate Kid mm -hmm. as being about William Zabka's character, Johnny. And this <laughs> that that's pretty much this show. It's like now it's, here's his chance. Right, and he. To I be mean, the hero. I think. I think you and I share the perception. He's amazing in this thing. I mean, He's great. This these scenes involve a lot of comedy on his part, but comedy by a guy who takes himself and his anger and his resentment and his feeling of being lost very seriously. And somehow or other, he does that. The script asks him to do that, and he does it without sacrificing either quality. I would say. Yeah, it pushes it. Like right to the edge of making him this this completely foolish character, and I also like about how he he is a good person, a, you know, despite himself. Maybe, yeah, yeah. and it, he he offers up some some pretty dodgy yeah you know, uh, bits of advice, and sometimes they end up actually paying off for the characters. And uh, yeah, he's he's really fascinating, and I do like that it does have two protagonists, essentially. Right. Uh, Daniel LaRusso is just as important in this story as, as uh, Johnny. Before I get to Carolyn and, uh, and Rich, I just want to say, amend one thing that you say, said, which is I think he offers bits of advice which is never meant constructively. Like almost <laughs> yes, never exactly. meant constructively. But and then accidentally. <laughs> has unintended consequences of being constructive. Like take the babe <laughs> to the golf spot, yeah, right. the fun spot, and then you'll score. And right. then they just end up having a good time on a date. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but even on that one, though, there was, there was a piece of – they want to paint the guy as a good guy, you know? Or sure, they want to yeah. paint him as he has a, he has a boundary – where his, you know, where his not good guy won't cross, right? Because, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because he was insisting with uh, to to this young uh, to his young apprentice at this point, great. Mm -hmm. you know, that uh, you don't ever take no for an answer, yeah. you know, like in terms of relationship stuff, you don't ever take no for an answer, and uh, and then he was really clear about when a no is a no. Uh, yes, yeah. You know, so so they're starting to paint in some lines that he won't cross, right. But, and I, I think there is, you know, Rilke says, you know, perhaps every dangerous and terrible thing is something vulnerable asking for our love. Mm -hmm. And there's I, – I, I'll be the first person to apply Rilke to the Karate Kid or to Cobra Kai, but somebody had to do it. Uh, I think there's a little bit of that too. Yeah. I mean we are being asked to see Johnny that way even though in many other superficial ways he's loathsome. Yes. <laughs> he is, and he has remained loathsome. Uh, Carolyn, before I go to you, uh, let's hear a little bit more of Johnny's particular version of the wisdom of the world. He winds up uh, – uh, being Mr. Miyagi to uh, a young Mexican-American uh, boy named Miguel. Uh, so let's hear a little bit of back and forth between – and this, is, this would be Johnny's version of being Mr. Miyagi. Hey, I just, I just wanted to say thank you. Well, you said it. So last night, was that like Taekwondo or Jiu-Jitsu or MMA or something? It's karate. Old school karate. Do you think you could teach me? What? No. What? Come on. When school starts, those guys are going to make my life miserable. That's not my problem. Well, if I just knew a little bit of what you knew, then I would be Forget fine. Forget it. I don't do karate anymore. All right? Besides, I need to find a job. Well, you could open your own karate school. It's called a dojo. Well, you could open your own dojo. Look, I'm not getting into this with you. All right? I'm not even sure I'm allowed to be around kids right now. All right? You want my advice? Stop being so annoying. Maybe you'll stop getting your ass kicked. So that would be the level of Johnny's helpful advice. Stop being so annoying and maybe you'll stop getting your ass kicked. So Carolyn Payne, you, you kind of went back to the beginning, to the Big Bang, as it were. Uh, you weren't really sure that you'd ever seen 
the original. Yeah, em- embarrassingly. I was not 100% sure. I had seen Karate Kid when I did kind of go to try to watch some of it. And, and this series has, like, flashbacks. I was like, oh, I vaguely recall some of some of this. Um, but it, so when this series... First of all, I didn't completely hate watching this, which is mm-hmm. a really big deal for me. That's like four and a half stars. That's a right. poster quote right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's your poll quote on this. <laughs> Feel free to use that. Uh, Neutral is I'm never being on this radio show again. <laughs> that, that means that's like three stars. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I started watching this and I, at first I was kind of like all snark with it because I was like, oh, look, like this karate kid had his great moments at 15 and now like his big aspiration is to be the best car dealership in Reseda. Like aim high shows you no matter how great your teen years are, like you're going to end up running a car dealership. And so I was kind of like, oh, this is sort of and, and and then the Johnny character is just a total mess. Uh, <laughs> but I really got invested in it and started to really like the characters, and I, I thought it was – I think it's well-written, and I like how the um, the teens involved I, – I think they've done really well with the teen drama yeah, part. It's almost a angle. redo of Heathers as well as Karate Kid. Right. Ken. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of layering. You have yeah. this, like, mean girls aspect yeah. and – the and all of the the bullying and and the teen relationships and I and there's like the family drama with you know Karate Kid and his family yeah. and Daniel Larusso you mean, <laughs> you mean Daniel Scott Russo. Bayo as I thought he might be yeah. <laughs> well Sam yeah you said that earlier yeah. that there's really two protagonists and you yeah. know I mean obviously in Paradise Lost the devil has all the best lines and so Johnny does too he's the one yes. who's been flung from heaven and he's <laughs> living out his existence and in I this do movie. agree I think he's spectacular right. in yeah. this so uh, he's, he's living out his existence in this strip mall inferno. Yes. Um, meanwhile, Daniel has been allowed to live in heaven, which consists of owning a big, big, big car dealership, uh, face on billboards, TV commercials, in a beautiful house, sexy wife. But there's some way in which that's also, uh, it turns out just heaven isn't all it's cracked up to be. And, and so Machio has to play that. And that's complicated, too. Yeah, one of the things that I took away from this is why why haven't I been seeing more Ralph Macchio along these years? And it's interesting seeing him as a because he's such a fresh faced young kid in the original Karate Kid. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting seeing him just as an adult, and he's not a plastic surgery disaster, which is also you know both of these guys just look like regular old guys. And uh, yeah, I appreciated his arc. I know uh, Jonathan was saying he he was upset whenever Daniel would intrude in the story, but I I thought the balance was nice there, and there was a good amount of supporting characters, all the kids and everything like that, and how all those little pieces are moved around and interconnect. And it still you know, kept me guessing even at the end as to who's going to be aligned with who. And, and you're really rooting for both Cobra Kai and Daniel's side as and well. And it's funny. Oh, are? Like there yeah. is something. I, I think in, it's very funny. There yeah. is I think it's at laugh least out loud, something laugh hard in, one, in each episode that made me laugh yeah. out loud. Yeah. And uh, uh, John Hurwitz and Hayden Schlossberg who did the uh, uh, Harold and Kumar films, which also surprised me because I walked in thinking I was going to hate them and then they won me over. Uh, they, they worked on this. And I, I liked that level of of comedy where it just gets on the edge and then it, it you know still doesn't you know shy away from digging into the drama from time to time especially okay. with Johnny it's time to go to Rich Holland and find out whether he still feels he's got a Papulian through line that'll take oh, us yeah, yeah, from sure. from Yanni Lauren to uh, to the royal wedding the Markles excuse me uh, to this it, no. it's it's all still to me about um, uh, what happens with with trying to to claim your 15 minutes um, and that's that's what's been carrying from the internet trying to do it to you know to good old Thomas Merkel Markle and uh and uh both of these guys uh wanting to to claim their their 15 minutes again um I found personally the uh the uh Danny LaRusso, LaRusso character really irritating I wish he weren't in this thing <laughs> um because I mean his 15 minutes went on for an awful long time mm. and he's still needing to go back and and rehash something that actually he turned out victorious in anyway you know i think that he's like a, a you know 15 minute glutton and um well obviously he has his face on a billboard yeah. right like, see? Uh, and yeah. he does tv commercials where he chops the prices yeah. up with his hands yeah. right that's so. just it's just well uh, here's my papillion through line which is I, I actually sort of 
you know, went back and watched most of the first movie too. Um, and I, I was thinking about the way in which in 1984, this was in its own way a slightly radical statement about multiculturalism, right? This is, we're dead in the middle of the Reagan years. Um, and it's a movie that in some ways has, it's always compared to Rocky. To me, it's more like the movie uh, Breaking Away in the sense that it's about people, about a young man, not of means, you know, from kind of the wrong side of the tracks uh, without a lot of resources, embracing somebody else's culture uh, and, and getting a victory out of this. And so here, when you think about the original Karate Kid, where does wisdom reside? Well, it resides with this guy from Okinawa and beauty is a bonsai tree and the blonde American Republican looking <laughs> karate guy, he's wrong. He's going to, his philosophy is no mercy strike first. That is not going to work at all. That's kind of in 84, a pretty big statement in a way. And it, it, particularly, I don't know, Rich, did you read, I don't know why I'm singling you out, except that I do know I'm singling you out. The piece in the last Last week's New Yorker about – is it Deandra Lawson, the photographer? Uh, it's a terrific piece where at one point she talks about the idea of where does wisdom reside. And she talks oh, about I didn't how – see that. And she, she, says, she says in The Matrix, you know, it's a black woman smoking a cigarette <laughs> making cookies. That's the mm-hmm. oracle, right? So where's the wisdom? Well, it's – Mr. Miyagi is where the wisdom is in, in 84. And so now you have this, you know, this – reversal of it. You have, you know, Johnny who has failed to embrace any of the values, not only of 1984, but of 2018. The world has become much more multicultural. uh, And he's been, he is the prototypical Trump voter. And so the politics of this get very interesting Hmm. to me. I don't know how this comes out. I've only seen six episodes, but uh, I'm intrigued by that. But there's a way in which it kind of links to the to the (laughs) Meghan Markle uh, Prince Harry Union in the sense that we're a much more multicultural place right now. You don't even make the argument that wisdom resides someplace else other than in white bread American values. It's already there. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah go, who was it? Holly, Hollywood has been writing that script for a while now, right? Yeah. Um, where uh, – and, and I think that Hollywood has a lens based on uh, – sorry – has a perspective based on um, who runs it, right? Mm-hmm. That uh, – that, um, that in the arc of the story, uh, the, the folks who will lose or who will not like uh, are going to have a sort of political angle mm-hmm. um, that uh, that has a tendency to be conservative, that has a tendency to be you know pro militaristic, um, and uh, and the folks who look like us are you know are always going to be the heroes of the story. So, Sam, you know, in the original movie, the Cobra Kai, is the, it's the embodiment of evil. It's like everything that could possibly be wrong is there in the Cobra Kai. But so this movie is asking us also to repurpose the symbolism a little bit. You know, here, here's a group of kids. Johnny is b- trying to teach a group of kids who are all the kids that he used to torment. Yes. They're overweight. They have facial deformities. They're nerds. They're weak. They're, they're this. They're that. And I don't know. I, that's an interesting thing, right? This, this thing that we're supposed to hate with the, you know, no mercy, strike first Cobra stuff being handed over to people that were invited to love or at least empathize. I also love the bit where he has to uh, sublet his space to the the yoga class <laughs> yes, and yes. they hang up the namaste <laughs> yeah. poster over, over the again. strike first. Um, but yeah, I love that whole concept that there is something of use within the the original Cobra Kai mantra that you know can can be used for good. And I, lo- I love the fact that he doesn't actually want these kids. It's you know, it's out right. of necessity, it's out of money, and he thinks they're all losers and weirdos and stuff. And I love the scene where he goes to kind of pitch why Cobra Kai should be allowed back into the the All-State Karate Championships because oh, after the yet. events of the first film, yeah. you know, they're they're banned for life. And he kind of stands up and, and gives this this bogus speech about how you know, he's taught these kids self-respect and confidence, and they've also taught him something. And by the, the end of the speech, he's kind of realized that he's been speaking the truth the entire time. And, yeah, I, I, I love that, how it, it, it challenges us, us in our 1984 kind of mentality as viewers. And, and they go, you know, ooh, boo, hiss, Cobra Kai, they're the bad guys. And, uh, how, you know, maybe there's something positive to be gained out of that when, you're, when your sensei isn't a complete psychopath. Right. And so um – uh, was always, oh, I, the yoga class. When the yoga class comes in, but he sublet the space. Um, did you notice what pose they went into right away? Cobra. Yeah, yeah they went to cobra pose, which, <laughs> nice. which is also right. I mean, that yeah. was not remarkable. It was a cute on. little visual joke. I did like there that. Are a lot I was of like, neat little ah. references and Easter eggs in there. Right. Yeah. But and, uh, so yeah. for me, I liked that Johnny, so he, he was the bully. Yeah. But 
now like his he's just so pathetic mm-hmm. that you know he ends up having to be the person who is like the hero and training these people who are the victims of bullying yeah. and i think that that's kind of i mean there there's like something to be said for that but also at the same i feel like that is kind of where Hollywood often goes, mm-hmm. like the person who was the bully or the hero, like the great one in high school, often ends up not uh, top of their game. It's I think the back also, to the future thing. Right. I right. think also there's that, you know, I mean, you, know, you were talking about the 15 minutes. There's also, we have to go to a break, I guess. But um, so Jill Silvio was in here on Wednesday and, and the, we just have these long, unstructured conversations. And she's polling people right now on their first kiss. And so she asked oh. me a question about my first kiss. And then she said, OK, nobody can see this, but you just turned four shades of red. Hmm. And it really is true that the ghosts that haunt us from our high school years. I mean, it seems absurd that a karate tournament from the <laughs> high school years of these guys, you know, would be that important to them now. But also seems completely true <laughs> and real yeah. to everybody about their high school traumas. Anyway, we do have to take a break. We'll come back. Ordinarily, I'm not one to spread gossip, but TMZ has just reported that Yanni was seen canoodling with the blue and black dress. Today's show was produced by Jonathan McLaurel and me, Kyone Wolf. Amanda Fish, here's Amanda Laurel Yanni Fish. The part of Bill Curry was played by Pat Morita. On Monday, we revisit our salute to prom night, but without the caged tiger in Florida. And now, back to Colin. Yes, the caged tiger at a Florida prom was one of our proposed topics that didn't make the final cut. But um, I also want to say before we get into endorsements that Carolyn Payne and I will be co-emceeing on June 9th, uh, the Art for AIDS uh, event in uh, Hartford. And so for details, you go on the Connecticut AIDS. What's the organization called, actually? AIDS-CT.org. Oh, you're so I had to be good. really careful how I said that. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. So very, very well done. So you go there and you can find out more about it. But uh, Carol and I would love to have you show up. And you get a little free piece of art at the end of the night. Oh, too. cool. Yeah. Okay. So endorsements. We'll start over here with you, Rich. Oh, okay. Um, two of them. First is uh, the Commission on Cultural Affairs uh, announced last month uh, that we're taking uh, applications for the first poet laureate for the city of Hartford. So if you know a poet, love a poet um, that uh, resides in the city of Hartford, uh, go to hartfordpoetlaureate.org and get an application in, send in some samples by June 4th, and you too could have this three-year stint. Self, self-suffice. Case closed. He lives in Hartford, right? You're done already with that? Yeah, self-suffice. Kareem, right. yeah, he's done. All right, We're well, done. then. All right. Self-suffice, apply. <laughs> yeah, you you um, definitely should apply self-suffice. All right, go ahead. Uh, oh, you had another one. That's one right. other. Yeah. Uh, Compass Youth Collaborative that does tremendous amount of work uh, in the city and schools with, uh, with kids uh, and run Compass Peace Builders uh, that uh, really do some amazing work with uh, – uh, with kids in the city who need uh, good, strong support uh, to keep them out of trouble, um, are putting on an event on Monday at Hog River Brewing Company uh, in Parkville, Hartford. It's called Network for a Cause. It's May 21st, 6 to 8, 30 bucks, open bar, and oh. food trucks will be there. Yeah. So uh, show up. It'll be a good time. Uh, nobody's getting talked to about anything. It's just come and hang out. Um, you could uh, go to their Facebook page, Compass Youth Collaborative, and uh, and scroll down and you'll find where to uh, register. All right. Uh, Sam Hatch, what have you got? Quickly, uh, keeping in uh, the spirit of Cobra Kai, I'm going to drop a trifecta of YouTube action. <laughs> uh, the first being my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash culture dog. I've been doing it for about four years. And I cover mostly home video and film and retro kind of home video formats. But uh, I've got a ton of stuff on there. So fall down that YouTube hole. And uh, the second thing would be an amazing Karate Kid ripoff that's been rather obscure, hard to find. You could get it on VHS maybe. It's called Showdown from 1993, starring Taibo mastermind Billy Blanks as a Mr. Miyagi, who's a high school janitor in this case. And uh, Christine Taylor is also in there, and it's it's amazing. It'll change your life. And the final thing to get prepared for solo next week is 
check out the channel of Oral Knots. It's A-U-R-A-L-N-A-U-T-S. They're a great uh, bunch of uh, commercial makers from Brooklyn who decided to quit their jobs and make silly videos, including one amazing Star Wars video where they have taken a bad lip-reading type approach by removing dialogue and replacing the entire storyline so that the Jedi are a bunch of you know, addicts and, and complete self-centered uh, weirdos and that the Empire is a family fun uh, kind of entertainment center. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing stuff. All right. Carolyn Payne. Um I am endorsing a show I discovered on Netflix when I should have been watching Cobra Kai. I instead um, <laughs> pissed my week away watching this and said, because uh, <laughs> that's how I roll. Uh, Evil Genius on Netflix hmm. is a documentary about the um, pizza box bomber that happened hmm. about like a little over a decade ago in Erie, Pennsylvania. It was an incredibly bizarre case where this guy robbed a bank against allegedly against his will. He had a bomb strapped to him. It ended up detonating. Well, the, it's really fascinating, and it kind of follows. It's this true crime documentary sort of uh, kind of like making a murder. They're sort of trying to get to the bottom of this, um, and it's like four episodes, and uh, it is not at all a waste of your time if you're into that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's an interesting watch. All right. Um, so uh, just a few things that I, I need to mention for you. First of all, I won't be back here to do the news until June 1st, um, uh, leaving uh, the country, actually, on Sunday. <laughs> uh, and so I'll be back here on June 1st, and we'll be talking about uh, Solo, the new uh, Star Wars uh, series a movie, the early years of Han Solo and Lando Cal Calrissian. Carolyn will not appear on that show. Uh, that and, movie I would actually, I actually okay. want to see, and, um, which is why I won't be. <laughs> I also, this isn't an endorsement because I haven't read it yet, but uh, we're also on June 29th going to do an unusual nose. We've never done a nose about a book because it just takes too long for the panelists to read it. So we're giving our panelists plenty of time to read a book uh, called The Power by Naomi Alderman. It is kind of a science fiction feminist story about a time in the future where women, as I understand it anyway, they can uh, produce electricity out of their fingers and shock uh, people and sh they become more powerful than men. Uh, so uh, Rebecca Castellani and Rand Cooper and Kate Russian will be on that panel. Uh, I'll say one last thing because I'm getting ready to travel. And I, So I have this – well, Samuel Johnson – famously said, none but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. Um, and I've always sort of lived, I've been a freelance writer for a lot of my life, so I, I usually don't write anything unless I'm getting paid. The um, exception being TripAdvisor restaurant reviews, which I've always felt this need to write. And so I've written a lot of them. Uh, and But I am actually going to sort of anti-endorse TripAdvisor restaurant reviews. I actually think they're kind of misleading because a lot of people who don't, don't know anything about food and don't know anything about restaurants write them. And then people go to places like Rome and Paris, and they go to these restaurants that, you know, a bunch of people from, you know, small Midwestern towns have said, well, this is really good here. They've got really good food and big portions too. And, you know, I mean, so don't use those. And, and what I'm really going to suggest, a lot of people are getting ready to travel this summer. If you're going someplace new or you don't know the train, there are food blogs everywhere. I mean, just you know, okay, I'm going to Rome. I'll tell you this. So Rome has like tremendous uh, – Elizabeth Minchilla is one person, Katie Parla. Uh, I'm reading their food blogs to find out where the good restaurants are, where the good food is because these are people who really live there as opposed to people who are visiting from Dubuque <laughs> trying to figure out the <laughs> restaurant scene. Who are you going to trust? The person who lives in Rome or the person who flew in for six days. Uh, so don't use do – use TripAdvisor for all kinds of other stuff, you know, to find good tours to go on and stuff like that. But don't use it for restaurant reviews. Those people don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and there are just, I mean, any place that you're going there are, that's of any size, there'll be really good food uh, blogs written by people who write and speak and think in English. So do that. I mean, you know, if you go to Paris, Dory Greenspan who's from here in Connecticut. She, I think she still has a really good food blog. So, all right. I'm all done advising you. Uh, this is my last show before I go away. I couldn't imagine three people I would rather spend it with. Uh, unless, of course, it would be Johnny Lawrence, of course. No, of course not. No, I wouldn't do that at all. So uh, thanks very much to Carolyn Payne and Sam Hatch and Rich Holland. Thanks to the producers. And uh, enjoy your weekend. And talking about that. And talk about everything as a matter of fact. Oh, yeah. Talk about Torrington, Vernon, Danbury, Waterbury, Oliveberry, Woodbury, hitting on New Britain. Vernon, I already said that one. Avon, Farmington, yeah, 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 yeah.